Hey, I'll, I'll take the intro. Good enough on a Monday morning. Good morning, good morning, hi at 9 News viewers. Monday, April 15th, tax day. Thank you for joining us here on whatever channel you're tuning in on. My article today is from a website called The Conversation, Academic Rigor with Journalistic Flair. This is written by a PhD in economics, Bo Young Seo. And this article is about taxes, so I love covering this sort of stuff. Marijuana tax revenue falls short of projections in many states, including Colorado. This was published this morning at 8.28 a.m. Eastern. Nearly half of Americans live in a state that allows legal access to recreational marijuana. 11 more states, including Wisconsin and Florida, are considering adult use legalization in 2024. One of the most common rationales for legalizing marijuana is increasing state tax revenue. How much revenue comes in depends on decisions states make about regulating the marijuana industry, including how it is taxed. The author of this article is an economist who specializes in forecasting how various tax regimens affect markets. Their experience spans industries such as legal recreational marijuana, alcohol, and tobacco. They've examined various taxes on marijuana in states such as Colorado and Washington to understand how much revenue has been brought in and the role state tax policies have played in that outcome. Marijuana is taxed similar to alcohol and tobacco. Recreational marijuana taxes are generally based on price, quantity, weight, or potency, much like other sin goods such as tobacco and alcohol products. Taxing sin goods is thought to shape public health policy and reduce the harmful impacts these products have on the public. These taxes, also known as excise taxes, are usually higher on sin goods that tax than taxes on other products by design. Taxing these goods aggressively <coughs> is more about the is more than about government greed. Bullshit. It is well understood that alcohol and tobacco use creates burdens on society, such as increased violence and health care costs. Economics economists like the author call these impacts on people who are uninvolved in a situation negative social externalities. Studies have shown that marijuana can have adverse health risks too, especially in adolescents. So governments often structure taxes on marijuana to try to limit its consumption. Most states with legal marijuana impose a marijuana sales tax. Others use a combination of sales taxes and quantity or weight-based tax. For instance, a half a dozen marijuana brownies that weigh a pound could be taxed as six or taxed on their weight. Taxes based on potency, a common practice for liquor taxation in most states, is also designed to reduce consumption. Taxes on spirits are generally much higher than the taxes on wine or beer. Marijuana potency can be taxed on the product's level of THC, the main, the main psychoactive compound in cannabis. Why state tax revenue fell so short? In 2012, Colorado and, Mar and Washington became the first two states to legalize recreational marijuana, and sales began in 2014. The states tax marijuana, the, these states tax marijuana aggressively compared to other states. For instance, Colorado imposes a 15% sales tax paid to, by consumers and another 15% on weight paid by retailers, which means it's paid by consumers, compared with New Mexico, which only has a 12% sales tax. Washington's tax is even higher at 37%. With taxes set high, Washington and Colorado expected their new marijuana industries to generate significant tax revenue. These predictions relied on surveys of illegal marijuana use and likely overestimated the consumption of legal marijuana, which tends to be more expensive than street drugs. In 2012, then-Governor John Hickenlooper predicted Colorado would collect more than $130 million in revenue from marijuana tax in the fiscal year of, of sales. The actual tax receipts was about $88 million. Washington experienced a similar shortfall. The state Office of Financial Management projected it would earn $434 million in taxes in fiscal year 2025, more than twice the realized revenue. What's more, both states' tax revenue from alcohol and tobacco were undercut by marijuana. I'm going to repeat that again for the viewer. What's more, both states' tax revenue from alcohol and, and tobacco were undercut by marijuana. Research that this author published with economist Keaton Miller found that people were consuming marijuana instead of alcohol and tobacco, causing revenue from those other sin goods to drop. You're welcome. In Washington, our research estimated that 40% or $56 million was siphoned off liquor, wine, and cigarette tax revenue from July 2014 to June of 2015. Both states did earn more taxes overall before le than before legalization, but the total increase is not as large as politicians predicted. 
On top of not collecting the expected tax revenue, states such as California, Oregon, and Colorado have experienced a slowdown or even a decrease in marijuana sales and tax revenue. One reason is because as these markets mature, the average price for marijuana is dropping. Lower prices are leading to decreases in sales tax revenue. For instance, marijuana prices in Colorado dropped 60% from 2014 to 2023. Colorado has been losing tax revenue ever since, and Washington's case is not much different. Taxing THC potency as the solution. One tax regimen that seems safe from falling part prices, as long as the same amount of marijuana is sold, is a potency-based tax, which taxes marijuana based on its THC content. To date, just three states, New York, Illinois, and Connecticut, tax THC potency. New York taxes marijuana flour at about $0.05 cents per milligram, concentrates at $0.08 cents per milligram of THC, and edibles at about $0.03 cents per milligram. That's in addition to the 9% state tax and 4% local tax. Are potency-based taxes a way to create a more stable stream of tax receipts? The answer is no. Potency-based tax will be effective only if consumers have a strict preference for higher potency products and resist switching to lower potency ones to avoid taxes. But research that the author conducted with Keaton Miller, Benjamin Hansen, and Carolyn Weber found that the consumer didn't care much about marijuana potency. Our research also found that growers and processors can easily reduce the THC potency of their products without incurring too much cost. They do so by shortening the grow time, changing the product mix, or providing low potency products as testing samples. That would be called rigging your results, right? Okay. As a result, potency taxes could have the unintended consequence of incurring suppliers to sell products with low THC because they likely would still earn similar profits. So, is there one ideal tax structure that can generate a robust stream of marijuana tax revenue? Not really. Tax policies do influence the market, but they can do little to overcome soft demand. From that perspective, a decline or stagnation in state tax revenue for marijuana is inevitable. As the market matures and more states legalize marijuana, consumers will have more buying options and competition will intensify. That means the price of marijuana and tax revenues associated with its sale will likely drop further in the future. All right, so let me kick this off. Normally, I, I, I like hand it back to you guys, and then I come in over the top and add my little two cents, but I'm just going to start this by adding my two cents right out of the gate. So I did not like this author's take on things because I felt that there were some major fallacies in the approach that Bu Young Sao took in this article. The first was the idea that there are harms in adolescence, and that as a result of that, cannabis should be categorized in that same syntax category. And this author included a hyperlink to the research which they used to support that. Very scholarly. Thank you very much. So I clicked on that hyperlink and I read that article and I couldn't find the supporting information from that article, which was written 10 years ago by two people who do not reside in the United States. And so anything that's an age restricted product that's used by youth is going to create harms. But that didn't seem to be the same line of rationale for why there are societal costs for tobacco use and alcohol use. So that didn't make sense for me. The next thing that didn't make sense for me is if this author is talking about the reduction in taxes from alcohol and tobacco as state legal cannabis programs are rolled out, is there not an argument that the impacts of cannabis use have a cost savings on those states because they have less societal or externality costs related to those communities using alcohol and tobacco. Didn't touch on that. The other thing that I thought was painful was the what, there wasn't enough talking about the unregulated market um, and, and the impact that that has, because when you talk about price compression in regulated markets, it doesn't really take into account that there's already an existing unregulated market. And then the last thing that I didn't like about this article was the idea that the high taxes have been a reason why we have had less participation in the regulated market and haven't been able to really wrap our arms around a lot of the unregulated operators in mature states. And so when those unregulated operators in mature states are paying zero taxes, if the goal is to wrap our arms around them and allow them to participate in a way that is affordable and safer and less stressful than, than working in the shadows, 
by reducing the sales tax as a percentage, you can actually grow your market. And so I felt like those were things that would have been um, welcomed inclusions from an article authored by somebody who has a PhD. This is Yaro Kubrin, Hi at Nine News. I'd like to know what my other panelists think. Well, 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 I mean, I... I, I I do agree with you, Yaro, that that he's using a whole bunch of prohibitionist rhetoric and you know, uh, uh, re reefer madness kind of talking points to try to demonstrate his point. And 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 just like you said, like when you go to the to the studies, there's there, there's no real merit there. And any time that you're going to tax cannabis based off of potency, all you're going to be doing is driving people to other markets. So then that way they don't have to pay those subsequent taxes. He hit it on the head. Mm -hmm. What's he got? Yeah, I, I like I like what uh what what Nick is actually saying. He's like he's like gas excise taxes are set based on the the quantity sold and has nothing to do with the pricing of the grade of gasoline purchased. So I wonder if that's kind of like the better model for excising with excise taxing on cannabis. What do you think, Yaro? I think it's less model dependent and more percentage dependent. When we are reading an article and I have to use the word 37%, that's high. We all know that if that was 3.7%, yeah. we wouldn't even be covering this. Mm -hmm. And so separate from the model, the percentages are egregious and those percentages of taxes are one of the three pillars of why we have a less robust functional regulated market in states that have programs. Mm -hmm. The other reason is a lack of retail, Mr. Cornhole. And so, <laughs> and then the third reason obviously is the cost of doing business and the lengthy times that it takes to get these entitlements and actually finally get a going concern up and operating. And so this notion that we are discussing tax structure instead of tax percentages fundamentally misses the mark. And so the key here to me is what's that expression? Uh, pigs get fed and hogs get slaughtered. Yep. The government's tax structure is hog-like. And whether it's based on potency, volume, excise, it doesn't matter. When you're at 37%, you are bleeding people mm -hmm. dry. Mm -hmm. And that's why the unregulated market, along with the quality, continues to thrive, mm. in my opinion. Any anything else you got to say on this, Matthew Saint Germain? I'm just standing. Okay, line this one out. All right, all right, fair enough. E two is about it. Uh, oh, although I, I would just say it's ridiculous. California has a structure that every time the government doesn't make its tax benchmark that it projects for a quarter, it then is the excise tax rate. Mm -hmm. So we, we're in this like treadmill effect in California where there's no way to ever reach the finish line. Because every quarter the tax rate goes up again. Yeah, and I, I, I just think that Gavin Newsom and his friends have structured at least the California market in such a way. They want those folks. They want the folks at the top of the hill in San Francisco. They want the folks at at Gavin's club there in Napa. Mm -hmm. Those are the folks they want in the cannabis market, and they're structuring it so that if you don't have generational wealth, really compete. Mm -hmm. Yep.